from the nation's capital, the Conservative Caucus presents Conservative Roundtable, an in-depth look at today's most important issues. Welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Howard Phillips, Chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors this program. Uh, it's an honor for us to have as our guest uh, former Assistant Secretary of Defense Frank Gaffney, who heads the Center for Security Policy and who is a great American patriot. He's always out there on issues of significant importance to the liberty and security of our country. And Frank, there are a few of them I'd like to get your views on today. By the way, we're taping this in mid-July and it'll be shown sometime later, so some of the things we're discussing may be history by the time you watch us. One of the things that uh, I wish were going to be history is the United Nations Law of the Sea Treaty. This is one of those silent killers. It's, it's <laughs> looming around there. No one really talks about it, but it's out there. The uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee unanimously voted to send it to the floor of the Senate for ratification, with people even like uh, George Allen voting for it. Um, what's wrong with the UN Law of the Sea Treaty? Uh, just a little bit of history. Sure. Uh, as you know, this treaty has been around for a long time. In fact, it was negotiated about 23 years ago. Um, Ronald Reagan, before he came to office, concluded that it was a sufficient infringement <coughs> upon American sovereignty that he would not agree to its ratification. He would not even sign it, let alone send it to the Senate. Um, he did so specifically on the grounds that there were provisions that would give rise to uh, a sort of prototype of world government. Uh, the particular focus was, of course, on the international waters, which cover, as you know, 70 percent of the world's surface. But there were instrumentalities of this world government mechanism that would extend beyond the oceans. For example, a court called the Law of the Sea Tribunal that would be able to assert jurisdiction over things that happened on the land and even in the air because they might have some effect on the waters of the world. Um, so Reagan quite properly said, thanks but no thanks. We're not going to agree to a mechanism that would be able to impose international taxes, for example. We're not going to agree to submit to an international tribunal on which we might not even have a vote, let alone be able to command a majority to protect our interests against those who would use it as a mechanism to further constrain our military or our economic interests or our sovereignty. Um, and there things stood. We observed parts of the treaty that we thought were consistent with our interests, principally in the navigation area, uh, until uh, 1994 when Bill Clinton, you remember Bill Clinton. Let me interrupt briefly and then go back to Clinton in 94. Reagan was so opposed to this treaty, which declared the seabed to be the common heritage of mankind, right. that he took one of his ablest uh, people, a fellow named Don Rumsfeld, and sent Rumsfeld all over the world, urging other governments not to approve this treaty. When I first heard of the Law of the Sea Treaty coming up again, uh, under George Bush, uh, I contacted Rumsfeld saying, hey, Don, did you know this was going on? And I didn't speak to him directly, but the word came back from one of his aides, yeah, and we're 100 percent behind it. So uh, clearly he got orders from headquarters. Back to 94. Well, just a, a quick aside on, the, on what Clinton did, because you'll appreciate this is sort of vintage Clinton-esque diplomacy. It was decided that they would fix the parts of the treaty that President Reagan opposed. And they signed a separate agreement, which by its own terms couldn't modify the treaty, uh, and yet were designed, I think, principally to confuse the innocent about whether the treaty had in fact been uh, solved or, or its problems really addressed. My judgment is that they have not. Unfortunately, President Bush, uh, in the aftermath of the decision to invade Iraq, uh, I think was persuaded that this was something that could be done to demonstrate to the Europeans and the rest of the world that we're willing to work and play well with others. We'll sign this treaty that has sat on the shelves largely 
since 1994 when the Clinton administration went to work on it. Um, I've, I'm quite sure that Don Rumsfeld, who very successfully persuaded our allies not to sign this treaty when President Reagan declined to do so, knows today it's still a very defective treaty. But he serves at the pleasure of the president. He serves this president very ably, I think. And I think he simply, you know, understands that's, so, that's where the president is. So the good news, Howard, is that I think essentially the entire conservative movement has come together in opposition to this treaty. And at the moment, it looks as though the United States Senate is not going to take it up, even though, as you say, it was in the last session favorably reported out. It has to go back to the committee and be favorably reported out once more. And I think people like George Allen, for example, have re recognized the error of their ways. And there are certainly a, a, a number of senators who would be very, very much opposed to it coming up. And I think the president's recognized that he's got other bigger problems to work on. And of course, Bill Frist is rumored to have presidential ambitions. So and he say. controls what comes to the floor. And it would uh, probably fatally uh, injure his prospects were he to. Yeah. Uh, our, our friend David Keene, who's yeah. the chairman of the American Conservative Union, of course, uh, put it very well at a press conference that we had with yeah. all of these groups represented. He said, any politician who wants the support of the American conservative movement has to understand we will remember how they addressed this issue and comported themselves. One other point before we move on to the next topic. Uh, you and I both have had the opportunity to speak recently with Vernon Clark, the outgoing, now retired, Chief of Naval Operations, uh, someone brought up by Bill Clinton, uh, named uh, Chief before Bush took the presidency, and held on by Bush in all this time. And he says the law of the sea treaty is good for the Navy. What's his reasoning and why is it wrong? Well, I, I think if you look narrowly at the parts of the treaty that we've been observing, namely these provisions that affect navigation rights, you could probably say it is good for the Navy. Um, there are some improvements that were made to the 1958 Law of the Sea conventions. The problem is that only about 40 percent of the treaty has to do, strictly speaking, with the Navy. Sixty percent of the text deals with all these other things. Who controls the international commons of the seabeds? Who's going to be able to adjudicate differences between nations? Who's going to be able to tax American citizens if we wish to make use of the ocean's resources? These sorts of questions are not within the purview of the Navy. Um, but having said even that, I'm convinced that the Navy's uh, lawyers have not properly appreciated the use that would be made of this treaty against the Navy's interests. Just to give you one example, Howard, there is sweeping <coughs> commitments on environmental issues. They make Kyoto pale by comparison. The provisions of this treaty that the Navy says would be of a military nature, you can bet other countries and uh, non-governmental organizations are going to say, no, 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 that's an environmental issue. Just to give you one, the Navy is currently being hectored because it's using sonars necessary to defend against quiet submarines, and yet they're being told you can't do that because it's affecting whales and porpoises. That will be an environmental lawsuit against the Navy, and it will be enforced, I'm quite confident, by an American court if this International Law of the Sea Tribunal weighs in. So for these reasons, I think it's not in, even in the Navy's interest, but it's certainly not in the country's. It's very dangerous, and it certainly would affect our access to mineral resources which are needed for our national defense and other things. I believe it would. <coughs> Let's move on to Communist China. Currently, a uh, Chinese government company, 70% owned by the Chinese government, <coughs> is attempting to purchase a giant American oil company, Unical, which has assets all over the world some of them in close proximity to U.S. military installations, which if the Chinese controlled Unical, Unical they could monitor what we're doing. Uh, there are other uh, strategic implications to what Unical does, can do, etc. Yet, uh, it's possible that Unical 
may agree to be bought by this Chinese uh, government oil company, and uh, all they need is the approval of President Bush to go ahead with it. Give us some background. Tell us what's happening. Uh, there are three reasons why I oppose uh, the sale of Unical to uh, the Chinese National Overseas Oil Corporation. The first has to do with, most immediately, the problem you've just mentioned, the oil assets. We're in a world where there isn't enough oil to go around, and as China's demand only increases, as does ours, it is almost certainly going to be the case that they will be withholding from our use or using as leverage against us and perhaps others access to the oil reserves that they're picking up. Not just, by the way, from Unical, which are relatively small, frankly, but in Sudan, in Iran, um, in uh, Venezuela, in Siberia, in Central Asia, uh, in Libya, you name it, the Chinese are moving in to take oil off the market. The second reason I'm concerned about this is it happens Unical also owns the only mine in America capable of producing something called rare earth minerals, a somewhat exotic family of minerals that are very important to a host of advanced industrial applications, including military, like smart weapons. In the absence of the use of that mine, guess where we have to get rare earth minerals from? Communist China. The third reason I'm concerned is I believe that this play for strategic oil reserves and this play for strategic minerals is consistent with a larger strategy that China has been following for some time that involves dominating strategic energy, yes, strategic minerals, yes, but also strategic materials, technologies, choke points, and regions of the world. You put all of that together, and you've got a much bigger problem on your hands than just Narrowly speaking, is it in the interests of Unical shareholders to sell off this particular asset or not? Will President Bush and the Bush administration object? It remains to be seen. At the time we're discussing this, it's an open question. I hope very much that this will not only be rejected, but that it will engender the kind of debate we have to have about the Chinese strategy and its implications. Two points. One, communist China is much more dangerous than the Soviet Union was because it's economically far more powerful. They're essentially... Thanks to us. Yeah, they're essentially buying America with our money because of our huge trade and fiscal deficits. I recall the battles we had about the minerals in Southern Africa mm -hmm. uh, back when the Soviet Union was the main threat, but this is analogous and in many ways more frightening because of Red China's economic power. Uh, before we go to the break, the other thing that concerns me is how the Chinese have hired people very close to President Bush, including the chairman of his uh, Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board, the fellow who was his media director in one of his presidential campaigns and others. And I understand his nephew, uh, his nephew has been hired by the Texas office of the Aiken Gump Law Firm, uh, which is uh, lobbying on behalf lobbying of this deal for the communists. That's correct. Any other comments on this? Well, just two quick points. Uh, one on the, uh, the, the question of the Soviet Union, as you say, never had uh, the kind of opportunities the Chinese currently do. As a result, when uh, Lenin putatively declared that the capitalists will sell us the rope with which we will hang them, the Chinese have done them one better, Howard. <laughs> We're going to be buying from the Chinese the rope with which they will hang us. That's correct. It will be our money. And on this question, I believe the corruption in Washington, and I don't think that's too strong a term, as a result of Chinese the Saudis do the same thing, unfortunately others do too, but the Chinese are particularly effective at it, hiring both serving government officials, it turns out, uh, but also people who have formerly held very senior offices to influence and neutralize the objections. A particularly egregious example, the public is not being informed about the true nature of the challenge we face from communist China, a challenge I describe as trying to supplant us economically as the premier power 
and, if yeah. necessary, thank, defeat us militarily. Thank God for Congressman Duncan Hunter, Chairman of the Armed Services Committee in the House, has done a great job. He has. And let me give credit to someone in the media, Lou Dobbs, mm -hmm. who has focused on this issue brilliantly. We have to take a break, and uh, we'll be back right after these messages with Frank Gaffney, who heads the Center for Security Policy. One of the top leaders in the Communist Chinese military declared that the United States is the main enemy of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the People's Republic of China, which is longhand for what we call China. Uh, we have been building up uh, our enemy, if that is a reciprocal term, by giving them most favored nation status and membership in the World Trade Organization. Last year alone, that gave them an $84 billion advantage in uh, money which is fungible. And uh, as a result of the extra money they have, they're not only taking jobs from the United States, they're increasing their military budget by 17% a year. It's time to stop sending technology and dollars to communist China. The Conservative Caucus, www.conservativeusa.org or 703-938-9626. Face the Truth is a production of the Conservative Caucus and is seen twice monthly on the station you are watching. We will be interviewing the movers and shakers of the pro-life movement. We hope to educate and even inspire you about what is being done in our country to protect and to promote the sanctity of life. Please watch us. Don't miss Face the Truth with Stephen Peruca and Conservative Roundtable with Howard Phillips right here on this station every week. Here's how you can become a citizen lobbyist and influence how your representatives vote. Write a letter to your congressmen and senators. Speak out on a call-in talk radio program. Write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper and call the Conservative Caucus for more information at 703-938-9626. Help the Arbor Day Foundation plant more trees across the nation. Plant a tree today for all the world to see. Go to arborday.org. Everyone's telling me how I should feel. It's not like I planned to get pregnant. Not now. When I got pregnant and didn't want to be, I was shocked and scared and so lonely. People telling me how to feel, what to do, and not sticking around when it really counts. So now, it's all up to me. But abortion, not me. I'm having a baby, and I can't run away from that. We'll make it. Yeah, we'll make it just fine. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips, and we're honored to have as our guest a great American patriot, Frank Gaffney, who heads the Center for Security Policy. Frank, we've got a lot of ground to cover. Talk to me about the UN and taxation. Well, we talked a little bit about uh, world government and international taxing authority in the context of the Law of the Sea Treaty before the break. Um, in September, uh, the UN has in mind a, what I think is basically an ambush for the Bush administration. Uh, back in 2002, uh, we signed up to uh, some uh, Monterey Declaration, I think they call it, uh, whereby it said we would be obliged as one of the developed nations to give in foreign aid 0.07% of our budget, uh, excuse me, of our gross domestic product. Mm. We give about $18 billion a year now in official foreign aid. That doesn't count all the private foreign assistance and help that uh, charitable institutions and individuals give. But that would be about $65 billion short of 0.07% of the, whatever it is we've got in our GDP these days. If you add that up over 15 years, that's about $845 billion short of what we are supposed to be committed to give. Uh, now, never mind that foreign assistance is demonstrably the most inefficient way to help people, that it breeds corruption, waste, and so on. But because the Congress will never pony up that kind of money for foreign aid, the idea is we won't have to, we'll just get it out of taxes. Taxes on airline tickets, taxes on currency transactions, taxes on international commerce, perhaps taxes on the internet, 
other ways, other ways in which you can argue <clears throat> the international commons is fair game and, for and what this unaccountable, separate, unrepresentative taxes. Separates the UN bureaucracy from accountability to any member government. Absolutely. Talk to us about uh, EMP. What is it? We talked about China and the strategic program they're pursuing, the likelihood that we may come into conflict with them over oil again before the break. One of the strategic plays that one could contemplate, and the Chinese clearly have contemplated, is solving China's energy problem, and for that matter, that of the rest of the world, by taking the United States out of the game. So How could words, that be done? By launching by a ballistic missile, perhaps even a single nuclear weapon, and not even necessarily that big a nuclear weapon, but one optimized to give what's called electromagnetic pulse effects, which against our infrastructure, our uh, electrical utilities and electronic devices upon which, of course, our entire 21st century economy and military and society depends, the bills, could be essentially eviscerated by that one pulse. So we don't use moving that. us from the 21st century maybe to the 18th century in a nano. So we're no longer a competitor with Red China for access to oil. We're not a competitor with anybody. We'll be and, lucky and, to feed our and people. And this can be done launching a missile from a boat in international waters off our coast. It could be done. In the twinkling of an we eye. We need a missile defense against it. We need to be prepared to try if we can to deter it. But we also need to be moving aggressively on a broad front to try to harden and otherwise protect this critical infrastructure against such an attack. Anybody doing it? I'm pushing very hard to try to get a closed session in the House and Senate to have this a briefing by a Blue Ribbon Commission that studied this and reported that this could be a catastrophe for the country. Get those recommendations adopted and implemented. It's not been done yet, but I'm working on it. Islamofascism. In the wake of the London bombing, suddenly the scales seem to be falling from a lot of people's eyes that the world is awash with a Bolshevik kind of ideological movement within the Muslim faith. I call it Islamofascism, others call it Islamism, but it has as its central characteristic a determined effort using violence, jihad, and intolerance to take over the world, to submit all of us, Muslim and non-Muslims alike, to their virulent, and hostile, and toler there, intolerant there uh, ideology. There are more active uh, militant Islamists today than there were ever active militant communists. That's probably true. Uh, and it is certainly the case that in country after country, we're hearing now about Britain, uh, the European continent, Pakistan, the Middle East, of course, some in the Far East, even here in the United States, you have Islamofascists who are being funded by Saudi Arabia and are breeding more of these hateful uh, ideologues bent on our destruction. We have to take a break. When we come back, uh, it, with a limited period of time, I'm going to ask Frank Gaffney what we can do to prepare for the possibility of a nuclear warhead being detonated on American territory. Please stay with us. Face the Truth is a production of the Conservative Caucus and is seen twice monthly on the station you are watching. We will be interviewing the movers and shakers of the pro-life movement. We hope to educate and even inspire you about what is being done in our country to protect and to promote the sanctity of life. Please watch us. Don't miss Face the Truth with Stephen Peruka and Conservative Roundtable with Howard Phillips right here on this station every week. The very first clause in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 1, immediately following the preamble, asserts that all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States consisting of a Senate and a House of Representatives. All legislative powers, that means you cannot give other entities the power to legislate, not the United Nations or the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund or the Federal Judiciary or regulatory agencies 
or federally funded private organizations. If you're going to stick to the Constitution, only the Congress can make policy, and the Conservative Caucus works to assure that Congress will more nearly conform to the Constitution. The Conservative Caucus, www.conservativeusa.org, 703-938-9626. Welcome back. If you're interested in the kinds of issues we discuss on Conservative Roundtable, I hope you'll check out the website of the Conservative Caucus, www.conservativeusa.org. And I hope you'll take a special interest in the work being done by Frank Gaffney and his fantastic team at the Center for Security Policy. Uh, they really are America's Defense Department. And you can reach Frank uh, at the uh, address which is currently on the screen. Frank, could you answer that question? There are a lot of people who say there could be uh, a nuclear detonation on our soil, and uh, what do we do about it? We have one minute. Howard, in part it would depend on how it's delivered. Um, there's concern, of course, that a device may already have been smuggled into the country. Um, that's a problem that basically involves finding that needle in the proverbial haystack. Um, there are sensors, there are techniques that if you get some sort of evidence that something <laughs> is in an approximate area that will enable you to find and, and but neutralize But should we it. the people move physically to avoid the likelihood of a big explosion in Washington, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles? Fifteen seconds. We're not going to know. If it's delivered through missiles, we have defenses that we can put in place. We need to be doing that faster and better, but that's a easier problem to solve if we have yeah. the will. Frank Gaffney, keep up the great work and thanks for joining us. God thank bless you, Howard. You. And, you. and thank you for watching us.